Are you cold? Uh, yeah. Oh. Oh my God, I can't breathe. That was a lot. When the lights turn off and the stars come out, bringing along with some of the most exciting opportunities to photograph the stars. Astrophotographers night after night are out there chasing the stars, looking for unique opportunities to photograph the night sky. Matt from BNH here, all the way in beautiful Iceland, and in this video, we're going to give you a full guide on how to photograph astrophotography. Everything from research and planning, gear and accessories needed to take those photos, and then we'll get out in the field and talk about some settings, composition, and so much more. So come join us. Feels like we're in like a planetarium right now, except IRL. Astrophotography is not for the faint of heart. Sometimes you're out there in the very dark and late hours, and it could be very cold or maybe really hot and you have a ton of bugs around that you can't even see. But when you see those final results, whether it be a star trail, whether it be a Milky Way, or whether it be even the Aurora, as we've photographed in this series, it tends to make it all worth it and brings you out there time and time again. First things first, research and planning. And you're gonna to wanna to put some time into this because if you're staying out late into the night, you wanna make sure that you're as prepared as possible. Considering things like the moon phase, the location of the stars, maybe even the hemisphere you're on are all important things when you start research. And this is where an app like PhotoPills, we talk about it in every star-related video, but it is so important to be able to look ahead of time at where the Milky Way is going to be in the location that you're trying to shoot in. The moon phase is definitely something you want to plan around as well. Having a new moon tends to be the best time to photograph the stars, especially the Milky Way, because without having the moon, you won't have that brightness to overpower the stars but doesn't mean you should shy away from a full moon. You typically can still fit some star photography in between sunset and the moon rising. And also, even if you have the full moon out, it tends to help light some of your foreground elements so you can still walk away with some good astrophotography. But the moon isn't the only light source that you wanna keep in mind when shooting astrophotography. Light pollution is a big issue when you're near any kinds of cities. They bring along different kinds of lights which come from those unnatural light sources. And also it just doesn't really look good in the background of your astrophotography. So if you can, avoid the cities and try and shoot in dark sky locations. Hey, if you can come to Iceland, I don't, there's like one or two big cities, you're completely fine when it comes to light pollution. You also want to keep in mind when tourists are visiting the location that you're trying to photograph. Now, most tourists aren't going to be out until 1 a.m., so you should be in the clear after that, but it also is important to keep in mind that if one individual tourist comes with a headlamp on, that could mess up your entire photo. So just try and work around that and also maybe politely ask them to turn off their headlamp for just a moment while you're taking your photo. But also keep in mind other astrophotographers if you're planning to use a headlamp while you're out there shooting as well. You don't want to mess up anyone's photo. I may have had that happen once or twice in the past and I won't let it happen again. Also, I don't know where this myth came from where people turn on the red light, lights of their headlamps and think it's not going to mess up photographs, but it absolutely does. While it might not blind anyone, when I have a massive red light in my photograph, I'm gonna be pretty annoyed. And last but not least, most normal people are eating dinner around this time, around sunset. And if you're in, pl in a place like Vic, Iceland, well, everywhere closes around 9, 9.30 p.m. at the very latest. So if you wanna have dinner that night, you wanna make sure that you pack that ahead of time. I'm going to be having a camping meal, which I think is perfectly fine. So I'm gonna go do that now. And while we're in the warmth, let's talk about some gear and accessories that you need for your shoot. Just say, not in the warmth, just in case. Freezing. Oh, you're rolling? Yeah. Okay. And by warmth, I literally just mean inside the plane, 
where unfortunately the heat is not working right now in here, but at least the wind is not as bad in here. But starting off with my camera and my lenses, I'm using the Sony a7R5 60 megapixels. Yes, sometimes lower resolution cameras are often better for low light, but still 60 megapixels, if I have all that resolution, I don't really have a problem with the ISO boosting it in these photos for the most part. It's a really low noise sensor, which is why I love to use it. And for my lenses, I'm using the Sigma 14 to 24 millimeter f 2.8 DG DN art lens. In addition to the 14 to 24, I'm also using two prime lenses that I like to alternate in as well. The 14 millimeter prime, fantastic for astrophotography, handles coma flare or lack thereof with this, really fantastic. So it really is built for astro, but it also has other applications as well, which is why I love carrying it. I have the 20 millimeter prime as well. Sometimes I find the 14 a little too wide, and in those cases I switch to the 20, and still having the f1.4 is fantastic for astrophotography. Now, there's a lot of reasons to love Sigma art lenses. They're fantastic lenses made in Japan, and just some of the finest glass out there. The 14 millimeter, one of my favorite things about it is that it has a collar on it, so when I wanna switch between vertical and landscape, and then it also has this awesome filter case built into the lens cap, one of my favorite features that Sigma's been incorporating into some of their newer lenses. Having the weather ceiling right here is so important because we're getting a whole lot of spray from the waterfall, and I know that I can count on these lenses, so. Before we run into accessories, I want to talk quickly about the tripod. This is an area that you want to pay particular attention to because you want a nice, sturdy tripod. We're about to blow away in this wind here. It is so windy. So having a nice, sturdy tripod is going to make sure that your camera won't have any motion blur when you're shooting a long exposure, which is what you're going to be doing in astrophotography. So make sure that you have a good pair of legs to pair with your expensive camera. All right, jumping into accessories, and one of the best parts about astrophotography is just how accessible it is in terms of you don't need that many accessories. In fact, I only really have one filter that I like to use, and that's the rear lens clear night filter, which is a rear lens filter from Hida, so you put it, yes, behind your lens. It's a little bit different, and it goes with some of those Sigma lenses that I like to use out in nature. And what this does is helps to absorb some of that yellow light coming from sodium vapor lamps, which is typically used in urban areas. So overall, it just helps with the light pollution leaking into your photos and helps your astrophotography. When I'm out photographing astrophotography, I also love to set up a second camera with a time-lapse function on it. And with that, comes tether tools, the power bank that I like to use with it because I just connect this to the tripod. I use the on-site relay system with a dummy battery into my camera and then I could run the time lapse for hours because otherwise the battery might die, especially on cold days like this. So having that power bank is going to help save my camera battery. It's also freezing out here. So I like to take a lot of these. These are hot hands or really whatever kind of hand warmers that you want to take along with you. I have them in my backpack almost at all times, but especially when I'm in the middle of Vic Iceland, which is very cold. Last but not least, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the Shimoda Action X50. My favorite backpack, I carry it everywhere, family functions, I get weird looks, but you know what, it's fine and it's perfect for astrophotography because it can hold so much gear in this backpack and that's why I love it. Once you have your location picked, which we've picked this awesome, I don't want to say a plane crash is awesome, but I mean, it does look cool. And this is amazing for astrophotography. This was a plane crash from 1973. Thankfully, all of the passengers survived and it's actually a US Navy plane, interestingly enough, but it sets the backdrop against a beautiful night sky here. So right now I'm gonna go ahead and look around for some compositions as we get ready. So I highly recommend scouting your location using photo pills way before you actually head out and shoot Astro. All right, so that's all of my gear. As you can see, not a whole ton, but all of this I find really helpful when I'm out shooting Astro. For now, it's really cold here, so we're gonna go to the car until the lights go out and the sun goes down, and we're just gonna get prepared. We have our composition set, so I'll see you guys in a few hours.
All right, we are officially back out in the field. The lights are out and it's around two in the morning, if I'm being honest. I've set up some time lapses around and I'm also experimenting even more with my composition, even though I had it locked earlier today. I'm now on the Sigma 20 millimeter and I'm just messing around right now, trying to get a little bit more cropped in with the plane. We actually lucked out tonight with a little bit of aurora in the background as well for some of the images here. So that's even more exciting, one of the many other benefits of being an astrophotographer. So going into my settings a little bit, since this is an f1.4 lens right now, I have it wide open. You can get away with 2.8. I would go for the fastest of your lens. So if you can go for a faster lens, of course, the more light, the better when you're shooting astrophotography. So opening wide is going to be your best bet so that you can get a lower ISO and less noise because of it. For your shutter speed, this is going to be dependent on your focal length. So at around 15, 14 millimeters, that's going to be around 10 seconds, but it really varies based on your focal length because when you're more cropped in or when you have a greater focal length, you're essentially magnifying those stars. And because of that, it starts to look like it's trailing if you have a too long of an exposure. So if your stars are trailing, that means that your exposure is too long for your focal length. And it doesn't mean that star trails aren't highly sought after, they definitely are, but that's not what we're going for in this particular scene. So to know exactly what shutter speed you should use based on your focal length and even your sensor size as well, you can actually type this into PhotoPills and they use an NPF rule, which is highly accurate to get your exact shutter speed. You put in your camera, which because of that, it has this sensor information. You put in your focal length and some of your other settings and it will output exactly what shutter speed it recommends. Now again, that is specifically for star points. And if you're looking for star trails, that's something completely different. But for star points, that's the shutter speed that you're going to want to use. And again, even if that feels too long and your stars start to trail, make sure to just raise your shutter speed. And if you have to, you can always crank your ISO a little bit more. For ISO, going in the range of around 2000 to 3200 is going to be your best bet. If the moon is out, maybe you can lower your ISO a bit since it's going to illuminate the landscape so much. So you wanna experiment with your ISO, that is going to depend on your aperture as well. For your white balance, experiment with around 3000 to 4000 Kelvin. This is personal preference. You should always shoot raw in these scenarios so that you can tweak them in post-processing to your liking. Since we are shooting long exposures, I'm of course using a self timer. Two seconds tends to get the job done any longer than that and I'm just impatiently waiting here. Uh, that's just to avoid any kind of shaking by using your hand to actuate the shutter. So using a self timer, absolutely crucial for these long exposures in astrophotography. One of the questions that constantly comes up is how do you get your stars in proper focus? First, you definitely want to switch to manual. No camera is going to properly be able to get those stars in focus by itself. It's just too dark right now. So what you want to do is use the focus magnifier, find maybe the brightest star in the sky. It's going to look like a huge blurb, but at some point when you twist the lens, you want to get it as small as possible, and then you know that you have your focus tack sharp. This is looking sick guys. The Milky Way is coming up right now in such a dramatic way, just as PhotoPills told us it would, and it's about to line up with our scene perfectly. I'm so stoked. This is looking epic. I'm so stoked. So I have my composition here of the plane crash in Vic, Iceland. A beautiful landscape on its own. With the stars in the background, it really shines. And I love photographing the stars, but having some kind of story in there, like the plane crash, like many things around Iceland there are with the stars in the background, having that story tends to enhance your image that much more. So incorporating some kind of foreground element will take your astrophotography to the next level. So there is the NPF rule, which 
tells you how long your shutter speed should be. But we actually have the lighthouse rule here, which is around nine seconds, this lighthouse turns and faces the plane crash. And so I can't take a photo during that time period. So I'm using the lighthouse to dictate my shutter speed here. It's pretty cool. That's Iceland for you. This is looking sick. And then one thing that I really like to do once I have my base shot for my astrophotography is I like to experiment with some light painting, whether it be lighting this plane like I have in the foreground here or lighting the environment around. Light painting is honestly just a lot of fun and a good way to add some variety to your photos. Highly recommend taking some kind of knee pad because I'm pretty young, I think, at least. I feel sometimes young, but uh, not tonight when I'm kneeling on the black sand beach because this is just really painful. Highly recommend bringing some kind of knee pad for astrophotography. Also, how do you choose between whether you want to shoot a horizontal or vertical frame? Well, it really depends on the scene that you're photographing. If your scene lends itself to more vertical, like this one, a lot of the times if your Milky Way is lining up in a way that's more vertical, then maybe you want to go for a vertical composition. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't also take a horizontal. If you're shooting digital, I mean, and most of us are, of course, if we're shooting astrophotography, there's really no reason to not take both. And I know social media will definitely appreciate those vertical format as well. Really look at your scene and see if you have a more horizontal Milky Way, then maybe a more horizontal photograph makes more sense and vice versa. So for this scene on Black Sand Beach, it definitely lended itself more to a vertical orientation because the Milky Way is aligned more vertically. And then I knew that I wanted to include more story. So I wanted to include a foreground element and I chose the beautiful black rocks that are on the black sand beach. Because it's a bit difficult to get both the stars and the foreground in focus, I had to do some focus stacking. That way I can get the foreground, which is this black rock, the middle ground, which is this beautiful mountain on the left here, and of course the Milky Way and stars in the background, all in focus for a perfect combo. Astrophotography is one of the most rewarding forms of photography as astrophotographers head out into the night and capture unique perspectives of the night sky. But I hope this guide helped you to get out there and shoot some astrophotography. But if you have any questions, let us know in the comments below. My name is Matt, and thanks for watching. You know, if anyone knows how to say star in Icelandic, let me know in the comments. I'm very curious.